All right, so go, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Healy Champion, uh, and so this is my talk, uh, Bailing Wire, Bailing Buckets are Bailing Out. Welcome to Linux Fest Northwest. I hope you enjoyed the party yesterday. Here are some things about me. Come on in. I'm just getting started. I spent a lot of time working in IT, uh, and now I say I'm in recovery. I'm a graduate student at UW, and I'm trying to understand the work I was doing in IT, what processes I was part of, what impact it had. All right, so this is my plan for the talk. Come on in, lots of seats. You can sit up front. Awesome. <laughs> no problem. Apparently, I'm starting like super on time. Uh, so yes, my plan for this talk is to begin where all good talks begin, with what looks like a digression, but turns out to be super relevant. And then I'll be talking about signs of failure in software projects, giving some thoughts about how to tell when things are going wrong, and maybe what to do. I have links and references in the slides, but they'll be posted, the, the kind of academic you know, links and so on, um, so you don't have to worry about the super small type. So let's talk about the Titanic. There's some recent analysis. Stick with me, this is relevant. I saw the smirks breaking out on your faces. It's a little bit surprising, but there's something new to say about the Titanic. Maybe we all know the story. The Titanic left England on April 11th, 1912. Expected in New York Harbor on April the 17th, packed tight with luxuries for the upper class passengers, but not fully equipped with lifeboats. Struck an iceberg, sank rapidly, and out of the perhaps 2,200 souls aboard, about 1,500 perished and 700 survived. So, a really sad story, actually. Uh, in transcripts of a post-tragedy inquest, there was testimony that the Titanic was on fire when it left the docks at Southampton. On fire. Have you ever gotten on a boat that was on fire? I have not gotten on a boat that was on fire before. Uh, so, yes, it was a coal fire. The coal pile to power a ship that size was three stories tall. You can't just spray some water on a coal fire. Maybe you've heard about those towns being, that are on fire because they're built over coal mines and they're still burning and they just burn and burn. You had to abandon the town. So on a ship, what's the best way to put on a coal fire? Uh, apparently the answer is to burn the coal. And so the stokers were shoveling in the coal as fast as they could, day and night. This fire may be in the worst possible of all places against one of the bulkheads that were supposed to make the ship sink so slowly, if it did get damaged, sink so slowly that a rescue ship would have plenty of time to arrive. There's no need for lifeboats if the ship sinks slow and help gets there fast. That was the idea. Hey, come on in, you're good. So the Titanic was running full speed in the dark when it hit that iceberg, shoveling in the coal just as fast as they could shovel it. There's some evidence behind this theory, this explanation of what happened. And these are some articles that you could read about this angle on the story. The first one is results of a computer simulation uh, that demonstrates this is possible. Without the fire, the ship may have survived. And then the later links are, to, um, are related to a documentary that was produced a little more recently uh, kind of advancing this theory and showing more evidence. Decisions to launch are not made in a vacuum. We know the owners of the Titanic were in serious debt. Maybe they couldn't afford to have the ship sit at dock. And coal fires on ships were apparently a normal enough thing to have happened in those days. And the fact that this one was worse because of its size and location and the design of the ship didn't register. The iceberg struck a weak spot, maybe the spot that was on fire, and the ship sank quickly. Anyone who works in tech should not be surprised by this story. We've all seen products get shipped or services get launched with known bugs and a firefighting team dealing with it day and night. The need for profit and keeping promises is a reality of existence in most environments. It pays the rent and the coffee bill. Maybe we have been the stokers ourselves, digging out the fire, full steam ahead. Maybe we were just the passengers. Maybe we read about it in the newspaper and said, whew, glad that wasn't me. Travel has risks. In free software, we have a few choices if we're developing independently. Nobody can fire us if we don't ship. Nobody can make us shut up about bugs and problems we see. 
but products do ship with bugs. And if we insisted that our work be free of bugs before we shipped it, it would never leave the dock. So how do we know if we're shoveling coal into the Titanic, if we're headed for that iceberg, and a boat that's in no shape to handle the impact we were promised would never come? What if we're the passenger, the crew, the captain? How can we tell the difference between the reality of software engineering and pending disaster? What are the signs of growing risk, and what can we do? I've been reading everything I can get my hands on to answer this question, and in the rest of this talk, I'm going to lay out how researchers see this problem, summarizing what's been observed in multiple fields. I'm just getting started with my project, so the view I'll share is not complete. At the end of our time today, I hope you'll have comments and questions. I'm calling these dimensions of failure the awful eight. First up here, we all make decisions with incomplete information. We all have limited time. Sometimes those decisions come back to haunt us. I have, I have props. Why do I have props? I don't know. I have props. One bailing wire type of risk. You ever seen a thing of bailing wire? I've seen it in code for sure. Maybe you use duct tape in your code. I use bail wire where I'm from. We use bail wire. Uh, bailing wire type of risk. And a pure technical debt. This might be self-explanatory. This XKCD comic is from like God knows how many years ago. It's an oldie but goodie. This is the notion that over time, the decisions we make in a time crunch, or because we're fed up, or because we're not sure what else to do, can come back and bite us later. One approach to measuring technical debt is to analyze code against formal best practices. So for example, is code repeated instead of being functionalized? You can analyze that and, and figure that out. Uh, in addition to analysis against those specific practices, um, I've also seen tools that use machine learning to predict bugs uh, in code due to complexity. But we can see some of this technical debt without using any detection tools. Uh, just try to compile from source or run a linter if you're feeling brave. And maybe the thing throws errors that mean either somebody hasn't cleaned up some sloppy or rushed corner, or else everybody's afraid to touch that corner because we all know it's a mess and if we fix the error, the fix might break something. This is not an unreasonable fear. See Heartbleed for an example. Uh, another read the code kind of risk estimation technique with code is for things like comment density. How often is something commented? Which is an element of style per project or per, per developer. But it also speaks how maintainable something's going to be by people who aren't us. Uh, or maybe by people who are the future us. I've been very grateful for my own commenting, uh, for sure. Some studies have even looked at whether the comments themselves, the text of the comments, contain clues to the presence of technical debt. Uh, when you yourself write, oh my god, this is a hack. So sorry, future me. That's, that's definitely a sign of, uh, of technical debt. And I won't try to summarize everything that's been said or done about technical debt. It would take way more time than I have. There's actually an annual conference about technical debt run by the ACM, the Tech Debt Conference. Um, so yeah, lots of time spent on that one. Uh, entire careers built on that one, I'm sure. Um, so, but there's some links up here. One method for assessing technical debt is, uh, that shows up a lot is called SQUAIL, this SQUAIL method. And there's this sonar cube tool that's LGPL that you can use to run and assess technical debt levels <coughs> on your own code. All right. So, well, this is kind of creepier picture that with the lights on. Somehow, somehow it's creepier. I don't know. Um, yeah, so another source of risk comes from what I'm calling lingering evil. Uh, this is stubborn bugs. We know they're serious and they're not getting fixed. So what characterizes bugs that survive our attempts to fix them? <laughs> this stuff is really fascinating to me. Um, the studies on this are really interesting. Um, my favorite probably is this Canfora et al. here. Uh, they looked at Eclipse, Mozilla, Open LDAP, and Views, and they found that long-lived bugs, in this study anyway, largely originated in the kinds of toe stubbing that some languages protect you against and others do not. So what do I mean? Like direct memory array access was a culprit for generating long-lived bugs because it's in some languages and not others. Uh, the same goes for bit expressions in control flow, so a bitwise or in a for loop. Beautiful. And yet, and yet, uh, it can be a source for bugs that take a long time for the general, the general developing kind of population to figure out. Uh, for a project written in Java, changing the exception handling 
uh, and some other component at the same time, even if it's a very simple change, uh, that seemed to generate long-lived bugs. So if you change the way that you're dealing with errors at the same time you deal with something else, it kind of obscures the source of the bug. Uh, another angle on here, this Saha, Kirshen, and Perry article, uh, they found that 90% of all long-lived bugs were user-facing uh, or had an impact on user experience, which is kind of ouchy, uh, and that 40% of long-lived bugs were quick fixes. So more triage and prioritization might help for those. All right, so those talk about <coughs> what's in code. Let's talk about the process of creating and maintaining a project. So there's rapid progress. Uh, what this, when the software's changing so fast, nobody can keep up with what's going on. And there's what I'm calling crickets. That's when nothing seems to be happening. These are items that might become apparent if you start poking around on the project site or repository. But there's a few issues with relying on this approach to gauge risk. For one, how often, once you decide to install something, how often do you go back and see how, it, how it's going? Is the community still as alive today as it was when you chose the package? And there are maybe a lot of ways to list it for rabid progress or crickets, because there's hundreds of ways to slice and dice activity. Opens and closes of bug reports, commits, code deltas, release frequency, number of contributors, lines of code, on and on. There's an entire academic conference devoted to this also, to mining software repositories. Yeah. Another way to look at progress or problems with a, a software project is to look at how work requests are flowing. So this is maybe the next step up from some of those repository metrics. Um, are outside people being able to get involved? Are ideas flowing in from users? Are new folks finding a way into the community? Or is the community mostly closed and not letting, not letting new folks come in? So on this topic of repository metrics, I want to talk just really quickly about, uh, about these, what some of these statistics look like. Uh, this is libraries.io. I don't know if everybody has seen libraries.io. I'm kind of looking for facial expressions. So libraries.io is kind of cool. Um, it's a dependency monitoring system. It ingests dozens of repository platforms. These extremely small icons represent all the different ones they ingest. And they monitor dependencies and let you kind of um, have a central view of what's going on with all the software you have installed, regardless of where you get it from. Uh, here in this screenshot, I'm looking at Julia, uh, which is a technical programming language, and it shows um, what languages Julia-related uh, things are written in, what licenses are in here, and you can't read it, uh, and what kind of projects inside of Julia are most popular. Another angle on this question is called Chaos, C-H-A-O-S-S. It's a cooperative project sponsored by the Linux Foundation. I don't know if people have seen Chaos. Maybe not. Um, so they also run uh, an entire like annual conference in the US and in Europe every year. Uh, they built working groups around three major areas of community health. Uh, they have a growth maturity and decline model. They have a diversity and inclusion model and a risk and value model. It's all a work in progress, but you can engage on GitHub and in their working groups, their conferences, and so on. The basic idea is that these working groups, the community themselves say, hey, these are the lists of metrics we think matter, and the project develops tools to visualize those metrics, whatever folks think they want to look at. Right now, they mostly feed in repositories, again, with this auger tool. And uh, some of the metrics, like diversity and inclusion, they don't really have a way to get that from a repository, but they're working on it, and this is a kind of collective project. Um, so here are these screenshots, what we see. This is just what Augur will show me if I ingest Julia by itself. And here's sort of some graphs of what Julia versus Scala looks like. And people have been telling me, oh, you should look at Julia. But I keep running into Scala. So I'm like, oh, what's the difference between Julia and Scala? How much do I like one or the other? But I have a cautionary note about these metrics themselves. And this is a problem that's really difficult to solve. Because besides all the many numerous measures, these graphs just scroll and scroll, um, they don't really tell the whole story. All right, so I'm going to grab my water here. Um, anybody recognize this graph or know where it comes from? Those of you that do know, don't give it away. Um, so if we imagine this curve as our own, like, hey, come on in, you're good. Take a seat. 
as your own roller coaster ride in the dark. You're riding this curve, okay? So it's flat at A. It's going nearly straight up at B. It's going down at C. So maybe the pattern's kind of hard to see if you're on the roller coaster. Maybe the people who work at the roller coaster park, they know about all the twists and turns on this roller coaster, but not me. I'm on the ride. I only see so far ahead of me. I might see the rise coming up, but I don't know when it's going to stop. And then it suddenly starts to stop, it starts to drop, and now I don't know when it's going to stop dropping. So if this is your project, maybe your one and only time riding this roller coaster, maybe you buckle down and try to fix things regardless of this shape. Maybe you're banging away in the dark trying to save this thing that you love. Or maybe you're shoveling coal. Maybe users see this graph and they start to bail. So let me give it away. This graph is actually derived from contributions to Wikipedia, which is not, it's not dead, right? <laughs> we know this does not predict the death of Wikipedia. It's like the seventh most hit uh, website in the world. Still, this graph stops at 2012. This shape overall gets called a rise and decline. And we see this kind of explosive growth and this leveling off. Uh, the might, the, this explosive growth might not have been sustainable and in some kind of uh, frameworks, they talk about this more as just stability or maturity. They don't talk about it as decline. Even though the line goes down, the idea is no way that we can keep on bringing in all those active editors and all these contributions. It's not sustainable. And Wikipedia has done a ton of work to try to change this shape and develop their, their group of contributors. Um, so don't be fooled by, by raw activity metrics. Um, we need to kind of discern the differences between purposeful sailing and frantic bailing. I have my, my bailing bucket prop here for fun. Um, so some researchers have looked at the social networks of projects like Linux and found a fairly regular pattern. We know this one. There's kind of the top 1% of contributors, that core group that do most of the work. Then there's what they call the middle 9%, which tells you a lot about how skewed it is that the middle is 9. Uh, so there's the middle 9%, occasional contributors. And then there's the bottom 90% who get called the long tail. So this is something that Kevin Krauss did, and James Howison in particular, have done a lot of work looking at these structures. And there's a good reason why work scales this way. You need clueful, trusted people with strong familiarity with the code base and expertise. You need, also need fresh ideas and fresh energy because it's a matter of trust, not just a matter of labor. So it's not just a matter of like how many bodies you're bringing in. But then there's a problem. There's a problem with that. I, I keep making it worse, I guess. Um, this, poor, this poor person, I think, speaks to this problem. So uh, one issue that can arise, I'm calling the weary oligarchy. So this is if folks aren't moving from the long tail into the periphery, that's to the middle nine, or they're not moving from the periphery, that middle nine, into the core, that top 1%. Then there's the succession problem. Um, the minute anyone in the core wants or needs to take a break. And generally the source for those core contributors is that periphery, is that middle nine. But if you don't let anyone enter the middle nine, maybe you have a closed door policy like number five, what we just showed. If you don't let anybody in, then you land here with this weary oligarchy, nobody to take anybody's place. This picture of this hiker is pretty evocative there because, you know, they've carried this pack for so long and now they're just wiped out. I don't think it was their idea to take a nap right here, uh, but it just kind of had to happen. Like, that's just what was going to happen. Um, we also have this notion of benevolent dictatorships, uh, this time-honored tradition in Floss. We love it. But if we're reliant on benevolent dictators, what happens when the dictator wants to take a break? What happens if they have a new idea and they want to try something else? Is a successor in place, or are we asking people to agree to be dictator for life? I'm not the first person to ask this question, of course, but a twist we might want to consider is, are we now limiting our, what we can build by our supply of willing dictators? Another interesting observation that's in this um, Bustos and Aponte, Busto, uh, Rodriguez, Bustos and Aponte, uh, is how your repository management software might really shape how your project is able to distribute trust and authority and might change the shape of what you're able to do. Number seven, we're almost there, only eight total. So, all right, invasion. Uh, this source of failure is relatively rare in what I've read, although maybe I have missed some things. Uh, this is when an outside influence disrupts the team itself. 
somebody becomes a maintainer that doesn't have the best interest of the project at heart. Like this is maybe the case of Event Stream, that toolkit in Node.js, did you guys read about this? Where a fraudster took over maintenance of the library to use it to steal bitcoins. Like that's a huge attack surface, right? Why? We're lucky maybe this doesn't happen more often than it does. Um, there's another project I read about which was basically destroyed uh, because they couldn't figure out how to keep spam out of their mailing list and it just got to be unworkable. The project had to be abandoned because of just too much spam, they couldn't get through it, um, which was sort of too bad. All right, number eight, this is kind of an end game situation. This is maybe what we think about when we think about a project failing. Uh, the fork is maybe, oh, you can't even tell that it's a fork. I feel better, this, this is a fork. Um, it's sort of a too obvious metaphor though. Unlike all my other too obvious metaphors, this one maybe I apologize for. Um, users make choices and they renew those choices uh, every time they upgrade or suffer through a bug. So you might get contributors leaving, they might be sick of the infighting, they might be getting bored, or you might have forks that fail. Uh, people might be leaving or never downloading or installing the project, and pretty soon that lack of activity just turns into this vicious cycle. Nobody's installing it, it's not that fun to work on. Um, developers maybe need users to some degree. Maybe the new hotness comes along, takes away all your users, and your developers start to go like, eh, I don't know. All right. On the other hand, if the community survives and they, they found a new project with that forking action, uh, they leave the project behind. Maybe there's still progress if the fork succeeds. There's a case study. Somebody got an article out of this one, although I think probably everybody in the room could recite the story uh, at the success of the LibreOffice fork from OpenOffice. It worked. Forks aren't always a bad thing. Uh, departure doesn't have to be the end. Transition is maybe inevitable. When I sit down to write new analytical code right now, I reach for R and Python, that's what we do. But I've got colleagues telling me to look at Julia, which is why my examples are from Julia. Once upon a time, Perl was the only one for me. But we don't really hang out anymore. So that was my awful eight technical debt, lingering evil, rabid growth crickets closed door policy, weary oligarchy, invasion, and departures. Are there elements of mi are missing? Let's talk about them. In conclusion, you heard me open with a story describing a fire on a luxury liner, the Titanic, and the fire generated a flaw. And this flaw was maybe a factor contributing to disaster. These research models I've been describing may be wrong, and they may not be the best explanation for failure. In the story I shared, Maybe that fire contributed to the failure of the a Titanic, but the iceberg also had something to do with it. My awful eight, this list of sorts of failures is incomplete, but this line of research is useful because we need sh clear shared techniques to identify project risk and talk about mitigating those risks. We want to prevent failures and disasters, and when it's time, we want to evacuate gracefully. We want everyone to make it out. Transition to a better place, not disappear beneath the waves. We want to manage risk and even eventual failure so that our community and all who depend on us can connect, live, and work with the technology we provide. I hope these reflections have resonated with you and I'm eager for your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey. So in your slide on um the weary oligarchy. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you've looked at or if, if, if there's been any research done into the effect that having paid contributors on a project, so like mm -hmm. Linux, lots of people are paid to work on Linux. It's not just that they're there because they're, they're having fun, it's their day job. And if they leave their day job, somebody might get hired in, into that same role and might take over that same sort of same maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I wonder how that affects the the transition from the long tail to the, the middle nine percent mm -hmm. it was, and, and uh, you know, into the sort of the one percent of core, and you know, how that how that affects the unpaid contributors, and, mm -hmm. and, and how that affects their motivation. And, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think we don't have all the answers to that one yet. I actually went to a great talk from Liz Johnson at Siegel. Um, couple months back who was talking about that exact topic and what she observed and I'm just going to try to echo what she saw is fewer and fewer as the 
as the, I guess, maintainer population becomes more and more uh, paid, there's fewer opportunities for independent folks. And um, maybe the things that get made also reshape somewhat toward compliance with, uh, say, rapid deployment into AWS, whereas maybe, you know, on something more sort of free friendly, um, not quite so fast to get that fixed or getting that taken care of. So the priorities have sort of shifted. Um, I think that's somewhat unknown right now, and I'm interested to hear, I guess, what people in the room have seen as you've started to sort of observe this transition yourself. I mean, what do, what do you think? Well, what have you seen? Yeah, so I mean, personally, like, my background with this is within the Debian project. Mm -hmm. We've had um, a, a few cases in the past where things, where people have tried to create paid positions within Debian, and it's gone horribly. Mm -hmm. um, Dunk Tank, if anybody remembers that from 10 or 15 years ago now, uh, was a total disaster. Uh, but then, you know, having third parties that pay people to contribute is a little bit more of a healthy thing. So, like, we have the Debian LTS release, which is sort of an unofficial thing. The people that work on it are their Debian developers. They're being paid by third parties to do stuff that nobody else really wants to do. Uh, like, like, like maintain old software and, and mm -hmm. like that. And most people aren't really interested in that. But if you're paid to do it, you, you find time. Um, and, and so I think that can be healthy. Um, but in terms of, you know, like coming up as a contributor, um, like on the Linux kernel or something, I think that's a lot harder because, you know, you're dealing with, you know, you're trying to keep up with this pace of change that's driven by, like, these highly paid full-time development teams, mm -hmm. you're trying to, you know, find a place to put your, like, personal interests, fit your personal interests into that, and it's, well, I think it's a lot harder to do, it's a lot harder to stay motivated, too, when, like, you're doing it for free, because you think it's fun, but somebody else out there is, like, doing ten times as much, and making a little right. bit of it. Yeah, I get that, uh, I'll get you just a second, I think, um, it may be that in this kind of transition, we're kind of in maybe a transitional period where some of us sort of still remember the what the what the dreams we dreamed when first these things were launched, and so we can hold the line on certain kinds of things. But it may be that as new people come in who have no experience or tradition in free software, uh, in the freedom portion of free software in particular, as their experience levels with that drops, the ability to hold that line may decline. And so now may be kind of our, our best moment for that activism to really take hold um, because we're in a, maybe a transition point. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I help run the Cody project, which is a massive multimedia project. And we've had similar debates over like bug, uh, bounties basically on mm -hmm. development stuff. And I think another, we, we've always voted it down. It's basically came up, I don't know, every few years, right? It's one of those things, but we're afraid to alienate the core contributors, mainly, is what it boils down to. The other problem that we've had is integrating this, like, okay, so these people paid thousands of dollars for these bounty, let's say. The code isn't good enough to integrate. Like, who's gonna fix it? Like, is the, is the person who actually wrote the code, he feels that there's a sign off. So there's always, we have this problem with GSOC projects as well, right? So we even take out bounties. We have the problem with GSOC projects where it's like, okay, this code's 60% of the way there, but that guy might have left or that guy doesn't feel that he has the technical chops to finish it, the student does. And then it's like, where does that code live? Where does that code, like, at least you have Google who doesn't actually care, <laughs> but We've definitely, there's been issues like that when, when we've had even third parties like pay for stuff and then they're like, why isn't that integrated anymore? And it's like, well, that code is all deprecated. Like you guys, somebody else needs to maintain it and we're not privy to that or nobody cares on the team. <laughs> and so right. I don't know, it's never, it's never worked well. And so we've, we've always basically not ever done first party and I don't think anyone's ever done third party bounty stuff. So that's good that it worked for you guys at least a little bit. But yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard line. Yeah. You have that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what you were just saying about the, the, the quality of, of a paid contribution being high enough, um, I have a little bit of an observation on that. In, in a particular case that I remember from a project I worked on, um, there was for many years a, a patch available for the software that a lot of people really valued. They really wanted to see it integrated. There were all kinds of arguments in favor for it, uh, all kinds of offers to, to work on it. 
but it was just, it was always kind of a terrible, terrible hack that had it been integrated, had it been merged, would have become an unmaintainable nightmare, nightmare for the core team. So how do you, like this is a really big problem, how do you find a, a path to accept contributions from outside the core maintainership, whether they're paid or not, and make them something that, that the core team can actually hold on to and, and build upon? It's a, it's a really hard problem. We suffer from that a lot because of the multi being a multimedia project, there's so many hacks that people try to do. Like, oh, I'm gonna output to two different sound cards or I'm gonna do stuff like that. And I think that we've suffered is because we don't have good documentation on our architecture, so people hack stuff in, right? And then it's like our, our core maintainers are like, no, you can't actually get that code in because it's a hack. And, it's, and, and half the time, you sometimes have people that are like, okay, I wanna do it the right way. And the problem is, is there's the lack of architectural documentation means that they can't do it the right way, or they have they don't have the knowledge. And I think we've suffered. Our project has suffered that a ton, where we've denied we've denied stuff that should have been included, um, that people have worked really hard on, simply because it didn't fit the architecture. What's worse is the architecture moving forward. So the architecture that doesn't exist yet, right? <laughs> Does the lack of architecture documentation affect? The or people's ability to come to agreement on what that architecture is? Well, unfortunately, half the time there's only one, like, there's only one core, like, actually, like, hardcore, like, video players, what I'm talking about specifically, we have a ton of stuff around that, and there's only, like, one guy who does, like, the majority of it, so it's all in his head, mm -hmm. and if you, how do you force a volunteer to write documentation on architecture that doesn't exist yet, that he, Tells you is really awesome. And then he's got to commit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that guy's left our project now. So a recipe for a weary oligarch at some point. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, can you get it out of his head before he's just fun? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Nope, and we couldn't. Yeah. 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 It's terrible. It sounds like every open source project. <laughs> 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 yeah, ours is over 10 million lines of code back from 2002. So, so a lot of places like that long. where you're trying to do things by committee and you want to continue on. It sometimes be cool to having a constitutional convention where so you have people that are interested in doing that, that that person that was the leader can actually do training mm -hmm. and maybe find some people that'll help them capture the APIs and the vision mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the real effort may be how to train the oligarchies and the people behind them. How, how do you train? I mean, I, I do this for, for, for non-charitable organizations for IEEE and for mm -hmm. things related to student science fairs and things. It's always a problem of how do you train your replacements? And that's what you have to focus on. How do you train your replacements? How do you train your replacement for keeping the conference that's going next year and the year after? Yeah. So I hear you talking about constitutional conventions. That sounds like a like a face to face kind well, of it is. Interaction, and I, I know Debbie does this. Yeah, I see yeah, you nodding, and I, really I wonder important. how well that works yeah, for you. It's very important. Yeah. It, it, it's like not just for the high bandwidth exchange of information, but also you work better with the people you've met. Like it's, yeah. it's yeah. just human nature. It's like, amazing. Touchy feeling crap. To that <laughs> <an asshole. laughs> it is hard to be an asshole. Well, Somebody well, face to face. Yeah. Like, it you, is. You yeah. actually get put up to the, yeah, for a lot of the examples that would solve that would help. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fix the problem, right. but it helps you move them into a sustainable problem long term. Yeah, I think it also helps you move faster. Like very quickly, you, yeah. you get past something. You establish a baseline and you can talk. Mm -hmm. I'm like taking notes over here. So there's <laughs> more things to think about and look at. Right. So has anyone else seen anything that worked? I've, I've talked about problems or uh, flaws. Now that we've arrived at maybe one thing, at getting people face to face, improving sustainability. Other things that are successful? Yeah. Not starting. Not starting. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about That's it. terrible. <laughs> words. I need more words than that word. So, one of the questions I can think of is people that are contributors that may not be being paid like to have their name recognized and like to be doing some of this stuff. Because if, if you have a project and you can have sort of mini conferences where people can come sit down and meet and meet the, the, the principals on there and get level sets and so they see them and they actually have a chance to be said, here's the problem with that type of stuff, it's not supportable, here's where I think we're going. If they, if that happens, there's a certain amount of inclusion that they're playing into it and that actually empowers them to start right, working more in the direction with you. And mm -hmm. so figuring out how to bring those 
that are hacking on the outside, so they're, that's less of a hack. So eventually the core team could take that idea and say, okay, we'd like to do a little, like to help a little bit more on this. Can you make these changes? Mm -hmm. That kind of mentorship that can right. happen, which is a whole skill set that takes serious time to work to, to learn and develop. So going back to the influence of money, I guess, that we started with in some of this discussion, do you think having funding for those meetings, conferences, hackathons from outside sources is another way that other people can um, kind of support these things? Or is it kind of, does it also distort things somehow to have that support? Funding get-togethers for, for volunteer contributors is a great way of, of building a project. Um, I think it's just hard to get that funding, right? Like, I'm a consumer-based open source project, which are, like, end user, which is uncommon, and we're used by, like, 30 million people, and we have, like, 50 grand of donations a year, right? And so it's just hard to, without... And any companies that we're working with wants us to give them something back in order to contribute, right? And wants us to not be as open source friendly in some way or something like that. And so it's just hard to find that balance and it's hard to get money to do things like that. It's hard to get sponsorship. It feels like sometimes a full-time job to like actually like manage all of that and like talk to companies and like actually mm -hmm. get, um, I'd love to talk to pe other people. Who what expenses that, yeah. does the coding project have? <laughs> Demi a lot, right? Conferences like, and DevCon, okay, uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, if you look at Demian's finances, Demi doesn't have a lot of money either, yeah. but Demi also doesn't have any uh, yeah. expenses, like, they don't, it's just... Yeah, it's, yeah, we don't really either, so, it's mainly just so DevCon. So if, if you're willing yeah. to spend the money, just like, yeah. like here's, here's 50 grand, this is what we're going to spend. That's what you know, we do, yeah. we'll, we'll take it all, and we're going to spend it all. And, yep, yep. And, you know, it's... You but, like, we don't have money for, like, mini-cons, or we don't have money for, like, other things, right? Yeah, yeah, like, that's... That's the struggle. The other, like, we've had some really good success with GitHub templates and, like, actually allowing, like, drive-by contributors to feel more inclusive. And I think that that's been a big focus that we've done in the last year. But the, the question that I have is, should you accept core architectural changes from even core contributors without documentation written, even if the features are awesome? <laughs> like that's like that's the biggest problem that we've suffered through and it's like it's getting people to write documentation is a pain especially when it's development stuff so, so I mean I think uh, one of the big things that isn't considered in this that kind of addresses and would be useful to all of it is that this is all very development focused it's all of those non-development roles that we keep talking about, the people running the conferences, the people getting the finances, the people writing the documentation. And Floss for a long time has had this problem not like giving those people any support, not recognizing them as contributors. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that is kind of the big step that needs to be addressed in like projects and in the community as a whole. Um, because if, if people feel like Oh, you you went and actually sat down on a thirty minute or an hour long call with the architect, and were able to write the documentation. You just like save people years of work by do, having that one meeting. You like you're a rock star. Like those are the, those are the people we should be holding up. I, Maybe those are the people we should be funding. I I think a lot of those people self fund. I think you know people don't like to talk about that. But I, I, <coughs> I'm, I'm, okay, okay, maybe I'm just like saying bad things. But you can speak out of turn, and I'll turn the mic like off. I don't know. Well, a lot of software is, is, is poorly documented because that's somebody's job security. Mm. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, they're making money. They're consulting yeah. to the industry. You know, they're mm. here where they've got a consulting business. Or, I mean, uh, you know, I, I could cite projects, but I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sort of skeptical. I, I, I haven't doesn't apply to my project. I, I haven't seen any sign of that. Yeah. I think I've, I've seen, seen any sign of that. I, I have a people like, in developers who use about? that strategy, so <laughs> I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, yeah. okay. I've, I've, seen, I've seen it, yeah. Maybe so, one of the things that needs to be done is to not necessarily pay the developers because it causes problems, but after the developers going to want to have time to be creative, is pay for a technical writer to come in and then publish the book to get more money for the development team. I think the real issue, I mean, I, I think the real issue comes down to that once it's documented, people have to agree on it. It's a contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, our problem is getting any documentation at all, ever, right? Like, that's definitely, it's not, like, nobody agrees on it when it's a wiki page, right? Like, somebody writes it and it's like, cool, like, that's, like, nobody, if somebody does disagrees with it, they're just going to go edit it themselves, and then that might be another war, right? But, like, there's not an actual wiki page that's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're doing man pages, right? So, well, our project is end user, like, there's not really, man pages would only cover, like, Architectural stuff is the stuff that I care about the most, like how the engine works and how like our video player works and stuff. None of that would ever be in a man page, right? Right. Because our stuff, our app is monolithic, unfortunately, right? So like, if it was broken out in pieces, if it was better designed, like VLC is, or something like that. Somewhere in the hall, there's somebody shouting about the unit's philosophy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We don't. Yeah. It was written on originally on the Xbox. Yeah. On one thread. I don't know that I don't know that people self self funding you know their stuff is necessarily bad, but I mean there has to be some way to reduce that tension between. We're, I'm self funding by doing consulting and, and writing the doc. It can be really hard to self fund for any length of time, mm -hmm. and if you well, want the project to go on for a long time, so you can, basically you're not going to do it. Most people don't know that. So one interesting angle. Yeah, people are bored every day. So yeah. like the whole self-funding thing makes sense to Americans, I feel like, more than you. I, I've had difficulties with that with Europeans. So like majority of my team is European. Like I'd say 80% of them, right? They are strongly against con consultant jobs. They're strongly against pay for projects. They won't do it. They all have day jobs. They all work on stuff. They want to hack on this. Sometimes they spend 60, 80 hours a week hacking on our project, but they refuse to make a dime doing it. Refuse to. And they won't even, so it's like, this guy might be really awesome in writing this thing, and I have a company that's willing to pay somebody to open source this thing. Nope, won't even help. Won't even, and like, if somebody else is involved, they'll, like, help them and give them hints, but they won't ever build anything for pay. And so it's interesting how strong and socialist these guys are. And it's like, especially Germans. Like, majority of my team is German, and it's, like, they... I cannot get a German to, I cannot pay a German to do anything to save my life, even if a company is willing to. And so that's the other problem that I have. Like, they won't even take self funding, right? Like, and I don't know what to do with that <laughs> as a capitalist American. It's super hard. All right, all right. We're just about at the end of our time. Um, I've noticed that sometimes there's one person in the room who hasn't said anything, but they have one last comment that they've been trying to find a way to make. So if somebody feels like they've been holding on to a comment, want to give time and space for that. No closing comments from an unspeaker? All right. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you.